Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring phases of intimate relationships. With me in the studio is Dr. Susan Campbell, a psychotherapist and management consultant with offices in Santa Rosa and Mill Valley, California. Dr. Campbell is the author of Expanding Your Teaching Potential, Earth Communities, Beyond the Power Struggle, and her classic book written in 1980, The Couple's Journey. Welcome, Susan. Thanks, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's good to be here. In The Couple's Journey, you, in, in some ways, defined, uh, I think, our modern understanding of intimate relationships. And the aspect of your work, which I think is, is exciting and challenging mm -hmm. for people, is that you see the process of being in a relationship as, as one of inner work. Yes, I wanted to be a counterbalance, I think, to the Hollywood notion that a relationship is supposed to meet all your needs, especially your emotional needs. And so I reframed marriage as a spiritual discipline or as an inner discipline so that people wouldn't expect so much about, out of it. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if things did go well, they'd be pleasantly surprised. And if things didn't go so well, they'd understand that it's a discipline. It's, it's a learning process yeah. for learning about life and learning about yourself. Yeah, and you've outlined five stages that an intimate relationship goes through. And I think most interestingly, you've pointed out the pitfalls mm -hmm. that uh, one is, are almost inevitable at each point along the way. Yeah, it starts with romance, mm -hmm. and there's a developmental task at each stage, and then there's a pitfall at each stage. And uh, shall I talk, talk well, a little I'll bit about romance? Why, why don't we, do we before we do that, let's just mm -hmm. list them. List all the and five then, stages. Yeah, quickly, mm -hmm. and then we'll come back yeah. and go through them all. There's romance, followed by power struggle, stability, commitment, and co-creation. Those are the five. Yeah, and co-creation has become a very popular I know, that word term. is around a yeah. lot nowadays. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so we certainly want to uh, arrive there uh, by the end of our interview together. But let's start now at, at romance, which I think many people would tend to think that's got to be the final stage. I mean, when you got romance, that's, that's it. it. <laughs> and what you're saying mm -hmm. is it's just the beginning. Yeah, romance is a visioning stage. It's the stage where, and you need it. A lot of people will say also, I think a, a lot of people who are maybe sadder but wiser, mm -hmm. will say, well, I'm done with romance. I don't need romance. I, I've been disillusioned too many times. But for me, and the research that I did, I found that people need to start with a vision of what's possible or they mm -hmm. won't even get together at all. Yeah. And they need to emphasize their similarities for a while mm -hmm. because a relationship is, is like a little tiny being and it's kind of fragile in the beginning. And so you need to not hit it with too much conflict right off the bat. And so people naturally talk about, well, we both like tennis and we both want to have two children and we both like vacationing at the seashore. And we, we look at our similarities, mm -hmm. and we, we magnify those, and we kind of downplay our differences during the romance stage. But we also need to not just look at our similarities in the present, but look at where we're going together. Do we have a similar life purpose or life path? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that now people are beginning to realize that a relationship needs to become conscious of your, your similarities yeah, typically in you, purpose. Romance says to me, you know, you get caught up in the intensity mm -hmm. of the emotion. Yeah. Of the, there's nothing like the thrill of a new romance. And, and that can be, become the dominating factor. Who cares about long range? Right, <laughs> right. People don't think mm -hmm. too much about purpose often. Yeah. But I think since the couple's journey model has been out in the culture now for about 10 years, mm -hmm. people are beginning to realize that you need something beyond just the two of us here and now. You yeah. need some meaning to, to kind of hold you together through the rough times. Mm -hmm. So the, the purpose is vision, but it's also bonding. And that's a very important thing in the beginning. You know mm -hmm. how people in the romance stage often don't see their other friends very often? Yeah. And we're kind of critical of that sometimes. But it's kind of necessary to do less of your other activities so you can put more into the relationship in the beginning just so that that bonding can happen. Mm -hmm. Then you can kind of slack off on it a little bit mm -hmm. after the bond is, is mm -hmm. firm. Bonding is, an, is another word for trust. Mm -hmm. And is, there's a particular pitfall associated with it? Well, the, the pitfall is that you get so addicted to that romantic feeling that you're afraid to ruin the romance and so you don't talk about things that you really need to talk about like your differences. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to say, well, in the, in the romance stage, 
I was a little bothered by your drinking, but now it's become a serious problem and I'm worried about you, mm -hmm. you know. But if you don't say those things, then these conflicts yeah. get buried and they come out in other ways. And then you get really disillusioned. And then you get so disillusioned because you don't even, the, the mm -hmm. bond is broken and the trust gets broken because you gradually build up this wall because mm -hmm. you haven't communicated your deeper feelings. Mm -hmm. Because there's always differences coming up in a relationship. And if you're afraid to wreck the romance, and, you, and so you don't speak about the things that really trouble you, that are serious. Mm -hmm. I don't mean the piddly little things like uh, toothpaste caps and stuff like that. I mean the things that are really mm -hmm. important to your life and your, your well-being. Mm -hmm. If you don't speak about those things and the other person is treading on your territory, so to speak, it, it will damage and, and mm -hmm. finally end the relationship. Well, in, in the romantic phase, people are putting their best foot forward. Yeah. And I guess part of that means we, we don't reveal our own uh, weak sides mm -hmm. or negative sides, yeah. and, and nor do we want to uh, criticize the other person. Exactly. And there's, <coughs> there's kind of a need to build a certain amount of trust before you can show your dark side. But part of this idea of relationship as a spiritual journey is that you build enough safety and trust in a relationship so you can go deep into your dark side. Mm -hmm. Because p part of the, the path of being human is to learn about yourself in total yeah. and to try to accept all of, of who you mm -hmm. are. And that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. But if you can build a safety, and that's what romance is for, to build a yeah. safety, and then we come to the next stage, power struggle. Right, and, and I guess, so what you're saying is, the power struggle can be difficult. And most couples, I suppose, that often is, is the, the turning point in many relationships. So you need to have enough rapport if you're going to get through that, mm -hmm. that very yeah. difficult stage. If you haven't done the bonding and you don't have a common vision, you're not in very good shape to deal with the differences. Mm -hmm. So the basic developmental task of the power struggle stage is owning up to the things that really bother you that are important, like the fact that in the beginning, I was attracted to you because you were so solid and reliable and predictable. But now, I find that, gee, you, you, don't, you don't say much to me. I'm not getting any feedback from you. Mm -hmm. And so I have to start talking to you about that because that's a real deep need of mine, feedback. Mm -hmm. Or you might have been attracted to me because I was so vivacious and talkative. But the reason you're not giving me any feedback is because you can't get a word in edgewise. See, what was complimentary in the beginning becomes polarized mm -hmm. later on, very, very often. Um, and you, you and other people, of course, refer to this as kind of a love-hate phase yeah. of a relationship where I, I suppose ultimately when you get close enough, you know, they say intimacy breeds contempt. You, can. you reach a point in a relationship where the other person is really mirroring to you the, the parts of yourself that are really hard to come to terms exactly. with. And, and exactly. And that's where... Uh, you know, the, the hatred, I suspect, is mm -hmm. often self-hatred exactly. that gets projected. That's right. And that's why so many relationships end at the power struggle stage, at that stage where you see something in the other person that really bothers you, but the reason it bothers you is because of something that's incomplete in yourself. I often say the outer struggle mirrors the inner struggle. Mm -hmm. So if I'm the kind of woman, for example, who needs a lot of attention and close and tender togetherness, and you're the kind of man who needs a lot of separateness and freedom and autonomy and we come together and in the beginning I admire that independence mm -hmm. and you admire my softness but during the power struggle stage that's when the darkness the uncooked or unfinished part of each of our individual journeys mm -hmm. comes up to kind of wreck things or mm -hmm. at least create a little havoc at that point if I'm able to look at this as a longer journey I'm able to see that the fact that you're so independent and I, and I need more feedback, if I can see that that fact shows something about me, mm -hmm. something that I still need to learn, and that is that I need to learn to feed myself more and not depend only mm -hmm. on your feedback. I suppose one of the real issues in this phase of a relationship is that I think we're all unconscious of our motivations for, for being in yeah. a relationship. Yeah. We have a lot of problems from our uh, families of origin, yeah. and we're often looking for a partner who's going to be more than just a companion and a lover. We're looking for a parent. Yes. We're looking for 
a person who is is going to make us feel uh, totally satisfied or totally mm -hmm. wanted and maybe we get that but then sooner or later we come to resent the very thing we're getting because it, it keeps us in a, a kind of a dependent it can uh, space. It, it very well can. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you'll be attracted to somebody because there's this promise that they can give to you something that you never got as a child. Yeah. And to some degree that's an illusion, but to some degree I, I find as I work with couples that I can help people view the relationship journey as an opportunity for both people to heal their childhood wounds. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to be my daddy and give me everything my daddy didn't give me, but if you can understand what my wounds are, if I can be honest about that and say, daddy never gave me enough attention, and when you shine that light of attention on me, even, even if it's just 10 minutes a day, that's so healing for me. Mm -hmm. And if you can be willing to give me that without feeling like that threatens your autonomy, and this is what I need to often coach couples to do, show the man, let's say in this example, that this is all you need to do to help her blossom. Mm -hmm. And to the woman, all you need to do is give him permission to have some autonomy, to have some freedom, and he'll blossom instead of worrying about whether you're going to get your own mm -hmm. childhood needs met all the time. So if you can start thinking about what the other person needs and give that, it's a healing experience for both. Because if I can let go of needing to cling to you and say he needs more freedom because his mother was smothering and controlling and was always looking over his shoulder, he needs an experience where he's in an intimate, loving relationship and somebody's not trying to control him. So if I can coach the female part in this example to give him a little space, mm -hmm. it can be very healing for him because he can then be both intimate and himself. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all trying to learn how to do. And that's what the power struggle stage is about. It's about finding out, can you be both intimate and be yourself? And that's why these, these differences need to come up, yeah. so you can be more of yourself in the relationship. I would imagine, though, that today much of the power struggle is also has to do with you know, the so-called war between the sexes, mm -hmm. the, the, the cultural issues that, yep. that men and women are always facing with each other. And, and traditionally, mm -hmm. men have had a position of power in relationships, and uh, women aren't putting up for it with that any longer. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of things that men are conditioned to do mm -hmm. out of their role. What it means to be an adequate male is to get the job done, mm -hmm. let's, say, let's say that. And so the male is trained to be very task-oriented and goal-focused. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, the woman's role has been to keep the family together, to satisfy everybody's needs so that there's harmony in the home. Now, these are traditional roles. Mm -hmm. We're liberating ourselves from those in our minds, but in our biology, we haven't done very well yet to liberate ourselves from those roles. So I still, as a woman, see my adequacy in terms of how nurturing I am and how much I can be pleasing and harmonizing everybody's mm -hmm. needs. And so when, when he is so focused on getting the job done out of his sex role conditioning, I can't understand that. Mm -hmm. I feel like well, he's being brutal and unfeeling because he doesn't care that everybody around the dinner table needs to get heard, for example. Whereas he's focused on whether or not he's going to get the dinner over with so he can get back to his briefcase, yeah. that type of thing, because there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on, yeah. on the male traditionally to get the job done, to bring home the bread. And I suppose when you get locked into these power struggle issues, it's really hard to maintain those romantic feelings that attracted you in the first place. Yeah. It, they go away sometime because we start feeling like enemies rather than lovers. Mm -hmm. you're, you're focused on your needs and I'm focused on mine, like these now, the sex role conditioning would be one example, or another difference between the sexes that, that, that I like to think about is the fact that men had mothers and women had fathers. Mm. And what I mean by that is you as a man growing up, your opposite sex, primary opposite sex relationship was with your mother, yeah. and mine was with my father. And mothers typically are a lot more available than mm. fathers. Mm -hmm. So then this will create a feeling in you of I had plenty of, of closeness with my opposite sex parent, my mother. She was around all the time, maybe a little too much. Now, this is not 
not across the board, this generalization, yeah. but it's typical. And mothers are often unconditionally accepting more than fathers yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so little boys can get away, you know, get away with things with their mothers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we go to the opposite sex model for the female. Most of the women I talk to, even in this day and age, they say that their fathers were somewhat unavailable, certainly less available than they would have yeah. liked. And so then they bring that need into the marriage mm -hmm. or the long-term couple relationship, mm -hmm. and they can't get enough. And their expectation and their belief is to not get enough, mm -hmm. whereas the expectation and belief of the man, because men had mothers, is to get too much. Mm -hmm. you know, let me out of here. Give me some space. Mm -hmm. So that's a typical misunderstanding that comes up at the power struggle stage. And men and women need to teach each other what each knows very well. So I can teach you about the fact that you can be close and still be yourself. And you can teach me that you can be close and take some space out of the relationship. Mm -hmm. That I don't have to have a, have a constant flow of attention. Yeah. Well, I know we could talk a long time about the power the struggle. Stage, There's yeah. so much energy yeah. there. But Let's talk about the next stage, which mm -hmm. is commitment. Stability is the third oh, stage. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped that's ahead. How you get, that's how you get to commitment, is you go through this very important shift mm -hmm. where you realize that your differences are for learning. Mm -hmm. Now, m most couples don't get to this stability stage, and therefore they don't get to commitment and co-creation. Most couples stay somehow stuck at the power struggle stage, but let's talk about how to make that very critical shift. Mm -hmm. It has to do with accepting responsibility for your own dark side, for saying that I'm a little too dependent. I seem like a really strong, independent woman, okay? And that's what you were attracted to in the beginning. But when I get into a relationship, I'm kind of dependent. I really have a need to please. And these kinds of things now wreak havoc. But if I can realize that what I really need to do is learn more independence, staying with that same example, and realize that that's mine to learn. It's not yours to feed me. It's mine to, to learn to mm -hmm. enjoy a few days out of town. You're, you're out of town all the time, and I'm angry about that. Well, instead of being angry about that, I get some, some work going where I'm out of town, too, mm -hmm. and I learn that, gee, it's kind of nice to have your own separate life. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy independence. Well, it sounds, and that that's moves you mm -hmm. then out of power struggle into stability. You learn your lesson that you're supposed yeah. to learn. It sounds like it involves a kind of uh, acceptance of, of the fact that at least a good chunk of this power struggle problem has to do with you. And if you can accept that in yourself, it's so much easier to accept and to yeah. forgive the other person. Exactly. And, and, and that gives you the ability then to move mm -hmm. to another phase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me just uh, give a couple of, of examples, sure. though, of, of other typical power struggles, because I've kind of concentrated so much on this togetherness versus freedom struggle. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you're a saver and I'm a spender. In the power struggle stage, we polarize, and you're, I, I call you tight, and you call, you call me extravagant. Mm -hmm. Now, in the stability stage, I begin to realize that I could stand to learn to save a little more, and you begin to realize that, gee, it's kind of fun to go out and spend some money on yourself once in a while. Mm -hmm. you know, just simple things like that help move you to the next stage where we realize that differences really are for learning. Mm -hmm. So we learn from the other person. Mm -hmm. That you really can, once you get mm -hmm. the idea that you don't have to be in struggle about mm -hmm. these differences and that the reason you're in struggle is because you haven't mm -hmm. come to terms with some part of yourself. Mm -hmm. Like if you're the saver and I'm the spender, I haven't come to terms with some kind of self-discipline. I haven't learned enough discipline. So once I learn what I need to learn, then we've moved through stability and we're ready for commitment. And, and I suppose the pitfall of the stability phase is, is stagnation. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. It's, it's avoidance of conflict. Mm -hmm. You work through a couple of conflicts and then you say, okay, we've had our, we've had our problems. We know how to work through our problems. And you just don't bring stuff up anymore. Yeah. So it's not like you reach stability once and for all and you never have conflicts again. What you do, though, is you learn an attitude about mm -hmm. conflicts that says conflicts are for learning. Yeah, and so stability might be best viewed as kind of a plateau, not a place to stay. Yeah, it's, it's an attitude, actually, mm -hmm. more than a stage. Yeah. It's that attitude that says the outer struggle mirrors something that I'm trying mm -hmm. to 
wrestle with within myself. Well, I think the, you know, the next phase, commitment, is mm -hmm. really important in, in this regard because stability without commitment can really degenerate, I would think. Yeah. Commitment to me says, you know, I'm going to be here in this relationship mm -hmm. and whatever happens, I'm going to work it through. And that's what it says. Mm -hmm. And in order to get to that place, you know, I put it at stage four, yeah. in order to get to that place and for a commitment to really have any weight, mm -hmm. you need to have gone through some power struggles and worked them through in the way that I was talking about where you own the thing that you tend to blame the other person for, where you say, okay, this is partly my problem mm -hmm. and we need to dialogue about this. Right. Otherwise, a commitment may be kind of meaningless. I mean, you make a commitment make when a you commitment. get married, but yeah. you have no idea what you're it's in right. for. You don't have the skills to work through conflicts, mm -hmm. and so a commitment doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So commitment is the ability to make choices and say, I'm going to give up that and I'm going to go for this. Because once you get to commitment, you realize the trade-offs that you've made in your marriage or in, in your committed relationship. There are certain things you're never going to have in this relationship, and there are other things that you value very highly. Yeah. And I, I would think that when you get there, uh, you realize that sometimes those trade-offs are just enormous. Mm -hmm. Just enormous. Yeah. I, yeah. I can say in, in my own relationship, one of the mm -hmm. things that I discover mm -hmm. that I, I trade off is a sense of a commitment to an ideal or an idea that mm -hmm. I value highly uh, as opposed to a commitment to a person, to a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I've come to realize for myself, you know, relationships are much more important than ideas. Mm -hmm. And so you uh -huh. sometimes give up your picture for one thing, I mean, that's one thing you give up at yeah. the commitment stage is your picture of how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the developmental tasks that comes into the commitment stage is accommodating to the other person's weaknesses. Mm -hmm. You've accepted the other person's weaknesses. So let's say I have a jealous husband, and he gets on me when I talk on the phone too long to male, mm -hmm. to male friends. Mm -hmm. Well, I could say, when he starts to get on my case about that, I could say, you have no right to dictate who I talk to on the phone. No, that would be power struggle language. Yeah. Commitment language, where you're accommodating and accepting this person as they are, looks more like this. Darling, you're my number one favorite person in all the world. These people are friends. These people aren't a threat to what we have. Mm -hmm. You and I have something really special. Mm -hmm. And so I reassure his jealousy, and it goes away, rather than attacking him for his weakness. Mm -hmm. So you just draw a bigger circle around all the conflicts that used to bug you. Yeah. And what's the pitfall or the commitment stage? The pitfall there is that you focus only on the relationship and you forget about what's going to come next, which is your relationship to the world. Mm -hmm. You say to each other, and this is the pitfall, we've been through so much and we've got such a good thing going and it's just us two or mm -hmm. us two and our little family. Mm -hmm. And the commitment stage is really a launching pad for giving back to the world mm -hmm. because you have such a strength of the two-ness now. You've really become a, a powerful synergistic unit once you're in a committed relationship. Commitment adds a lot of power to each person. And you've got to do something with that energy. But if, if you don't know about co-creation, if you don't think about giving back to the world, then the relationship can stagnate. Well, let's talk about co-creation. And so co-creation is analogous to an individual's vocation. At some point in an individual's life, you have this feeling of calling, if mm -hmm. you're lucky. Mm -hmm. You have this feeling of, what am I supposed to do with my life? And that's what a couple can arrive at, too. And it's a very wonderful feeling when a couple gets to that. Not that many couples that I interviewed. I interviewed 100 couples. Maybe 10 of them had really reached the co-creation stage. But they were taking her talents and his talents and blending them together to give something back to the world. Mm -hmm. And they were having a lot of fun doing it. Well, how do they describe what that feels like? Well, they usually describe it as it's kind of like a, a, a mixture. We've mixed something that she likes to do and something that he likes to do, and we've made room for both of us to do what we like to do. Like one, one couple that I interviewed started a publishing business. Mm -hmm. And he was very good in the business end, and she was very good in the interpersonal end, in recruiting authors, and uh, they were both good editors, so they had some overlap there. Mm -hmm. And it was just 
a process of exploration, finding out what, how, uh, what can we create that uses his talents and her talents and uses them for mm -hmm. some advantage for the community. And does it typically tend to be that, that they're working together, that their careers are blending at that point? It doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Those were the, the more glamorous examples are those where people are starting a business or a, uh, some kind of a, a very visible contribution to the world. But it can be dinner parties that you give for your friends. Mm -hmm. It can be more of a quality mm -hmm. that maybe a safety where other people, when they're around mm -hmm. you, can feel like disclosing themselves. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be a product. It can also be an attitude that mm -hmm. you that you create, but you create it together somehow. Mm -hmm. Now, earlier in our program, you referred to the process of being in relationship as a spiritual journey, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got just about a minute uh -huh. left. I wonder if you can tie it all together yeah. and, and describe the spiritual aspects of mm -hmm. the co-creation phase. Yes. Well, if you start out your life as just a me and you know, kind of a selfish, ego-oriented self, and then you match yourself up with one other person and that expands your identity boundaries just naturally. So part of the spiritual journey as I see it is is a journey of becoming one with all that is. Mm -hmm. And becoming one with one other person takes an awful lot of energy but once you've done that it takes a lot of letting go. Yeah. Letting go of who you thought you were yeah. and illusions and of what boundaries you... Boundaries begin to dissolve. Yeah, they uh -huh. dissolve and they reform mm -hmm. but you, you understand that when your boundaries dissolve and reform you're more, not less. You mm -hmm. didn't lose anything in that process. So the process of, of joining with others and of, of unifying with all it is isn't a loss process. And, you, the, and the couple's journey, the, especially the co-creation part where you join your forces with someone else and you create something, a third thing, you find out that that's absolutely an addition to yourself. Mm -hmm but you don't even think of it that way anymore but you find that it's a rewarding addition rather than a loss and that's a spiritual process becoming one with something beyond yourself mm -hmm. susan campbell such a pleasure to be with you and mm -hmm. to discuss this very important road map of how something as common as an intimate mm -hmm. relationship can be a, a guide to the very depths and wholeness within us thanks so much for being with me thank you